This conference this will, conference now, be will now be recorded. It's interesting. Good morning. Um, I know that uh, we've got some people logging in. This it's an interesting time that we're dealing with and trying to do this hybrid. I'm hoping that the sound quality works. I was reading up on how to deal with some of the stuff um, with GoToMeeting when you're doing recording and showing some media. Um, I'm, I'm hoping the people online, can you guys hear me okay? Can you do a little chat? Uh, tell me if you can hear me properly. Let's do something in the chat. Yeah, I, can yeah, I can hear you well. Hear you yeah. well. Perfect, yeah. thank you. Thank you very, very much. I'm hoping it can work well. I hit a couple buttons with um, GoToMeeting because I'm gonna show a video to start this off today and I'm hoping everyone can hear it well enough because I've had problems before doing that. So uh, topic of today, and I'm, I think it's pertinent, uh, we are dealing with this an awful lot right now, in uh, situations we're representing buyers in particular, in which we have tenants in the property. Um, and we've had state law rent control in place for two years now, and that's, that's caused us uh, how, uh, to have to adjust our business practices to accommodate the fact that tenants uh, need to be uh, given like a 90-day notice if the buyer for the property is uh, going to be moving into the property. Now, if the buyer of the property is an investor, those tenants have the right to live there. So that, that's that been a change as, as far as our business practices. But I um, wanted to share this to start this whole thing off because I think it's pretty fascinating. Um, let me find it real quick. And this is a true story. Now, there's going to be some real terrible... Uh, language uh, written in this, but this is the reality of a a, a tenant from hell. Hi, this, Hi, is, this is Phoebe Foster with Fountain Property Solutions. I received, I received a call this week from an out-of-state out owner, owner who had recently evicted a disgruntled tenant, tenant who had been paying rent for many months. months. And the and owner, owner was interested in possibly, possibly selling. selling. The home the is home. in the Broadmoor Bluffs area of Colorado Springs. But I was discouraged as I surveyed the neglect, not only in the yard, but also in the wood rut in all of the window frames. But in decades of being a real estate agent and a landlord, nothing could have prepared me for what I was about to encounter. This is a story about a tenant from hell and every landlord's nightmare. Put on your face mask and let's go inside and, and see, see what, what kind of damage, damage an angry, angry tenant, tenant can do. The first thing you notice when you walk in is not the destruction, but the overwhelming smell as you open the front door. There was human and animal feces left in the living room to greet you as you walk in. I felt like I'd stepped into the twilight zone as I looked around and couldn't find a visible, visible surface, surface that hadn't, that hadn't been spray painted, spray painted with vulgarities. vulgarities. In addition to the spray paint, the carpets were saturated with urine throughout the house. And it's my understanding that the tenant had a menagerie of animals. After, After she got, she got done, done with her paint, paint, she took a big hammer and damaged most of the walls. <laughs> the owner the moved out of state, state over a decade ago. It appears the property manager hasn't even set foot in the property in at least that long. <laughs> The person on the lease isn't the person who's been living there. Nobody knows what happened to the original lessee, but it's believed that she died and then a relative moved in. And it's the relative who moved in that did all of this damage after she'd been evicted. <laughs> She spray painted all of the appliances, the sink, the cupboards, the countertops, the pantry. She also took the stove and dishwasher, but that's probably pretty insignificant under the circumstances. 
It's my understanding she had cats, but tragically, when she moved out, she left two of them in the bathroom. It appears as though they've been there for quite some time. The story is from the neighbors and the owner and this. The night the tenant contracted, contracted to have a new have roof, roof put on. on. She told she the told roofing company, company that she was, she was the, the owner. owner. The, first the first time the owner, owner heard of it was when the roofer started demanding payment. In addition to everything else, they did a horrible job on the installation of the roof. <laughs> When the tenant took possession, the house was pristine. It was all painted white and absolutely spotless. So here's part of what's making me really angry about this. Property manager told the owner that the tenant filed a motion asking to be allowed back into the house to get her things after she had been evicted. The property manager said that request was granted and she was allowed in. But here's the rub. If you actually do a sheriff's eviction all of her stuff would have been outside and not only would nothing be left inside, but the courts would never have allowed her back in. From all From accounts, all this, this lady, lady was crazy, crazy as a bed bug. bug. The neighbors the said they danced, they danced a jig when this nightmare tenant, tenant who had been a thorn in their side for years moved out. This room was really creepy. The plastic bins there were full of animal feces. I don't have any idea what she kept in there. And the freezer was full of meat and has had no electricity to it for months. The neighbor said that it took months for her to move out, which also leads me to believe that there's something fishy about the property manager's accounting. Something smells stronger than the odor in this house and I intend to pursue it. All of this damage was done after the tenant had been evicted. One of the morals of this story is to hire a property management company that's credible. I'm going after one that's not. It looks, it looks like, like she ran, she ran out of spray, out of spray paint, paint since, since this is the only room in the house she didn't touch. touch. If, if I, I ever get resolution, get resolution to any, any of this, I'll do a follow-up follow video, video and let you know, like you know how it how turned, turned out. out. Thanks, Thanks for, for watching. watching. So, so this was, a, again, a realtor from um, Colorado Springs. And the... From my understanding is this house, it, it did go on market. 
in the condition it's in. And it sold for about 500, I think it was about $500,000. It required between 250 and 300,000 worth of repairs. Obviously there's the there's the normal sort of repairs you would expect, which is the rotten wood, you know, on the windowsills, but all the interior stuff. I mean, what what a mess. And it is it's unfortunate because most tenants are good people, uh, don't cause issues like this, but there are some out there who are, for whatever reason, very vindictive people. And again, the question here, this is Colorado, and I'm not totally familiar with uh, Colorado tenant land use, uh, landlord law, but she said sheriff's eviction. If it was a sheriff's eviction, all her stuff would have been outside. So who gave her permission? She had a court order to get back into the property. Yeah, yeah, Jane? But some of the stuff was still in. Some of it was. So obviously, who handled the eviction? If Was it the property management company? How how did that all evolve? Because, you know, I, there's a lot of unanswered questions. How as, do you evict the tenant who's dead? Well, the tenant had died. This was, a, saying, the, dead? this was a squatter. This was a squatter who had moved in, and obviously that person was for whatever reason allowed to stay there because if you see, if you heard what she said that the the neighbors were saying that this person had been there for some time and they were very happy to have her gone so how long had she been living in the property after the true tenant had passed so i don't know i mean what had been the arrangement as far as making payments on the on on the obviously she had stopped making payments which is why she ended up being evicted but still it this, this is a case in point of probably the worst scenario that I can think of uh, outside of someone just burning down the property. I mean, we know during the, the terrible situation that we dealt with during the recession when homes were foreclosed on uh, and the people who had lost their property ended up pulling cabinets and pulling uh, appliances and things like that. And that was, that was challenging enough. And uh, but in this case, someone willfully just causing that kind of damage to a property. Yeah. When was it posted? Sorry. This was posted um, May 3rd of 2020. May 3rd, 2020. So about a year ago. And she had said she'd do a follow up if she gets some resolution. I, I haven't seen anything about this. I heard about this yesterday. Um, and uh, it just, yeah. Yeah. It'd be worth giving her a call. It would be. I'm kind of curious to see what happened to this. You know, because this. Did she face criminal prosecution? In the you would think so if they well, could have. The yeah. There is no tenant. Yeah. The, the tenant trip. You the know. Entity, entity yeah. is gone. The so per. They really don't, can't do anything. Well, the first the person who was squatting in the property. They're just squatting. Yeah, but they it's damaged. They damp, but they damaged property. Well, if yeah. you can prove it. If you can prove it. Yeah. I, yeah. Good question. I mean, really, how do you go after somebody who shouldn't be there in the first place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Challenging. I, I, and again, I don't know. That's a good point there, Bill. Well, I'm just wondering because across the street from us in 09, mm -hmm. the recession hit, the people uh, owned four houses. They were poster kids. Mm -hmm. So they leveraged every house to another house, and they all went tumbling down. Finally, their own house went into foreclosure. Mm -hmm. And they tried to get refinanced, and banks wouldn't talk to them. So they started renting it out to people. And this group came in one night literally in the middle of the night, and there were tile layers, mm -hmm. and they stayed there for about a month, then one night they were gone, and all the doors, just the middle of winter, the doors were left open, the house was damaged, and the next morning the sheriff showed up with um, a summons to these people for some kind of a child care violation, but they'd already gone. Already left. So the owner of the house had, had given them somebody an opportunity to rent that house, okay. and really didn't check it out at all. Well, it, quickly. It, can be it, it can, it can, things like this can evolve, which is what made me think we really need to talk about this and what's happening with tenants. And um, the thing I wanted to pull up right here, I can find it. It's always challenging with all these added things with, um, I pulled up a PDF. I have so many headers and things right here to the side. Here's my PDF. I know she left two cats to die. I 
be interested in how the lady died. Yeah. Okay, so this is the residential purchase agreement that everyone knows and has seen. In the section on possession, uh, this is really, really important. When you're writing a deal and you have a, uh, a tenant in the property, there's a section here on line 376. If a tenant is currently in possession of the property, buyer will accept the tenant at closing. Check one. No, seller shall have full responsibility for removal of tenant prior to closing and if applicable, tenant relocation costs. And then uh, the other one is yes. If yes, unless otherwise provided herein, all rent shall be prorated as of the closing date and tenant security deposits. Any other deposits held on behalf of the tenant by seller shall be transferred in full to buyer at closing. All funds shall be handed, handled through escrow. Buyer and seller are encouraged to attach the ORF uh, 70 investment property addendum to address additional items related to the buyer accepting the tenant at closing. So basically, when you fill out this form, you're saying my buyer wants to accept the responsibility of a tenant, or no, uh, my buyer wants to move into the property. And my and wanting to move into the property, uh, they don't want to have a tenant in there. And so uh, it's now the responsibility of the seller to remove the tenant. Now, the question that we've been dealing with a lot is how do we remove the tenant? How does the seller remove the tenant? Um, and it's very, very, ever since uh, statewide rent control hit, we have a lot of very specific methods for that. And so the, the problem here, and this is on the OAR, the Oregon Realtors, website. If the tenancy has lasted long, longer than the year, can the tenancy be terminated for the sale of a home? And no, you can't terminate for selling a home because the tenant has the right to live there. However, if the buyer intends to move in, then the tenant can be given notice. It's a 90-day notice. Um, and that means uh, you have to provide the the landlord must provide the tenant with a 90-day notice. If the landlord owns more than four dwelling units, an amount equal to one month's rent, so that they're paying for the tenant's relocation costs. And if terminating for sale of the home to an owner-occupied buyer, evidence of the offer. So in other words, the tenant, the, the, the tenant is to receive a copy of the sales agreement so they know that there's a legitimate thing. So the sooner that the, the landlord can provide a copy of the sale agreement to the tenant that starts the clock for the 90-day notice so when you, when you close you as a buyer's agent depends yeah. on whether or not the buyer wants to assume the responsibility of the so tenant, they want the tenant out. then it would be 91 days after the notice is given yeah so if the tenant has a lease yes longer than the 90 days this does not apply that's correct so say the tenant has a lease the lease has to be honored no one can break the lease unless the tenant agrees to it. Yeah, Jane. So <clears throat> that's what we did in our case. Mm -hmm. The lease was running through next February. Correct. So the landlord um, paid the tenant a bonus mm -hmm. to right. terminate the lease and go month for month. Yeah. Cash yeah. yeah. And they'll also get another bonus when they can do that. Yeah. And that is really. So what timeline? Uh, 90 days after the, Still the 90 days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's whatever you can agree to. Yeah. So obviously the tenant can agree to move out sooner. I mean, during the recession, when we had a lot of foreclosed property, uh, the when we were dealing with um, REOs, with, uh, say, Freddie, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac uh, REO properties, uh, we were dealing with people who were, um, we had some contracts with that. And when we got a new contract, it was responsible of the agent who had that listing to go out to the property, evaluate, first of all, what is the condition of the property? Uh, does it need some, some maintenance items done on it immediately? Because the banks do not want those properties to deteriorate because that hurts their the value of that property. And then, of course, are there people living in the property? Is the, is the property, the people living in it, are they the previous owners? Uh, who still have to get out, or are they tenants? If they're tenants, uh, either one, they would uh, 
you know, tenants had the right to occupy those properties even before statewide rent control was passed. Uh, so we would often have this thing called cash for keys. And our agents were authorized to provide up to $2,000, say, we want you out within a certain amount of time. Here's some money to get you out the door. And so often, the usually the tenants would collect and accept those cash for keys and get out so that then the repairs that needed to be made to the home could be made so that we could get the property listed as quickly as possible because the banks did not want to hold on to these properties during the recession. And so the cash for keys was very effective. Um, and in today's world, you know, with this 90 day notice, yes, obviously tenants can agree to leave earlier. So can the buyer, uh, excuse me, can the seller provide some incentive to get them out the door? So when you're, say for example, you have a uh, duplex, buyer's going to go in the loan. Right. So one tenant has to be kicked out. Right. And if they want to get the other tenant out just because they want to. Right. Can they do that? Not legally. So even okay. unless the tenant agrees. So they got to buy them out. Right. Or, so a or a family member is going to be moving into that other unit. So, yeah. so, so these... These are part of the, the, the things that we are dealing with with statewide rent control. Uh, because the, the thing is, a dwelling unit is considered not just the house, but say there's an ADU connected with it. So the ADU has a tenant in there. The buyer is purchasing the house, but they want to use the ADU as a rental. They can't kick out that tenant that's there. They cannot, unless they're planning on moving in with all with all honesty and uh, being as ethical about the whole thing as possible. I'm going to move my daughter into the ADU, she's going to be living in there and she's going to be paying me rent. Maybe, maybe not, you know, so, it, it, and I don't know what kind of case law has happened about someone who's using excuses like that to get someone out and then putting a new tenant in there at a higher rent. You know, I, I don't know. I, I really don't. I haven't heard of anything like that, but this is really what the law is. A dwelling unit is a dwelling unit. So if the buyer is intending on moving into a home with an ADU, you know, they have to, you have to understand that. And our representation of our clients show us that we have to follow these rules and regulations. Now, this is statewide rent control, and this is still the law. Now, add on top of that, what's happened with COVID? <laughs> because we had eviction moratoriums for non-payment of funds. And I know there are people who legitimately needed that because they lost work and they couldn't pay their rent. However, at the end of the eviction moratorium, they're obligated to pay all that back rent. You know, that that is really what the thing was. You can't pay rent right now, but at the point of time when you can, uh, when our moratorium is done, you're supposed to pay all that back rent back to the landlord. How many people, well, it, it's it's not really, really clear. It's and like forbearance like student homes. I, I don't I, I don't know how that is. Um, there are some a couple of things I I pulled up here on this because the thing is the the eviction moratorium ends July 1st, and so people can start to be evicted for non-payment of rent. There's one exception, however, and that exception is if the tenant has applied, this is a new law. This is a new law. And it's, uh, this is the, this is the one about the house bill, excuse me. Um, it's not this one, let me pull this off to the side. Here we go. If the tenant has applied for, if you're unable to pay your rent, because of financial hardship that occurred on or after March 16th, 2020, give the attached form to your landlord to qualify for protection. So, you know, this is again, the COVID eviction moratorium. The landlord then could take this document that is signed and then apply for the 80% coverage of- that, that expires tonight. It expires tonight, that is correct. Now, there is a new law that just hit the books, and it's right here. Let's 
it is okay so this is a staff this is this is the committee rules and i believe the governor is signing this it prohibits residential landlords from delivering a termination notice for non-payment or for taking uh, auction i mean they meant action for possession action for possession based on termination notice for non-payment if tenant has provided the landlord with documentation that tenant has applied for rental assistance requires landlords to inform tenant of tenant right to protect against eviction for non-payment on or, before, on or after July 1st, 2021, allows landlords to initiate or continue eviction action 60 days from that time that tenant has delivered documentation of rental assistance uh, application. So again, it, it, it's kind of like an extension of this. And this was this is actually from the House Committee on Rules, and I believe this is now going into effect. I, I may be wrong on this, but it's an extension. It's basically the eviction stopped as of July 1st, but this is kind of an extension to give the tenants more time. Only if they undertake to apply for aid. Yes, and because the whole- they don't undertake to apply for aid. That right? They can be kicked out for non-payment. Um, the, the whole thing here is when COVID first hit, there were all these rules and regulations put in place to protect the tenant, which is which is which is, was very laudable for people who le legitimately couldn't afford to pay their rent. However, they didn't take into consideration that landlords still had mortgage payments. They still had property taxes. They still had HOA fees. They still had obligations connected to keeping the, the property maintained. You know, anything goes wrong, the dishwasher breaks, they need to go out there and, and fix the dishwasher or replace the dishwasher. And, and that wasn't taken into consideration. Then we finally got some protection for the landlord in at least 80% of their rent being being um, covered um, but this new step here is supposed to protect the landlord up to a hundred percent of their rent which is the landlord obliged to advise the tenant of this action are the rules set up so that they are they are required to do this that's a good question and i don't know that I mean, how many tenants would even be aware of it? yeah there is Okay, so if Oregon eviction moratorium to expire at the end of June, there is this one. Eviction grace period extension. Existing rules governing the emergency grace period in place through June 30th, 2021, landlords may continue to terminate tenants for non-payment if the emergency grace period were not extended. The most common way that extension is triggered is by a tenant giving their landlord the declaration of financial hardship. Effective July First, the emergency period will cover debts accrued from April 1st through June 30th, and the new grace period to pay the non-payment will extend through February 28th, 2022. All the protections regarding non-payment prior to the end of the grace period, such as prohibitous, prohibit, prohibit eight, not being able to evict for non-payment, assessing late fees on the non-payment balance, or filing actions to recover non-payment still apply. But these protections last until February 28, 2022, regardless of whether the tenant lent, handed a declaration before July 1, 2021. So this Senate bill will require that various forms be updated. The verbiage and ballast reminders must be updated to reflect the new emergency grace period. And any 10 or 13 day termination notice for non-payment of rent must include a statement that the eviction for non-payment of rent charges and fees that occurred accrued on or and after April 1st and before June. 30th is not allowed before February 28th. So we're based, and of course, a landlord cannot report to any credit audit uh, uh, credit uh, company about the fact the tenant's not paying, making their payments, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then when ev evaluating an applicant, a landlord may not consider it an eviction case, you know. So and then expanded tenant's rights to set aside judgment, all that sort of stuff. So. It seems an awful lot of the rules are still geared toward protecting the tenant. So how does that really impact us in our representation of buyers? And I, I can say that right now we've had situations, as, as Jane, you saying that there are tenants in place which we know are not paying their rent or uh, are doing other things that may be in violation of, of the tenant landlord rules.
Yeah. Yeah. So uh, anyway, those sort of things are still part of what we're dealing with. Um, so why are the landlords, there was some sort of resistance for the landlords to apply for this. I remember reading about it, that the program is being under subscribed. Yeah, and I think it's, well, the, the trigger is, is got to be the tenant giving that notice. So then they can, so then the landlord can then apply for I the money. It was an original program. Was it You're talking for the one for the 80%? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know why any landlord wouldn't, especially if they haven't received was, a penny of anything. Wrong with it. Yeah. And I'm not sure whether or not it had to do with repayment. Could be. Because somebody is not getting paid. In this. Right. I mean, even if they're getting 80%, what about the 20% they're not getting paid? You know, and, and all yeah. that. So. Because the tenant's still not home. The, the tenant is, and they are. In, in our reality over this last year, we have seen a number of tenants take advantage of this and actually abuse it. Uh, and I know for a fact there are there have to be legitimate people. But in our experience, and of course we probably hear the horror stories in which we have people who we know are still working who say, well, I you can't evict me for non-payment. I'm not going to pay my rent, but it's the COVID eviction. You can't evict me. But they're still working. And what's a landlord to do? And now we also have situations in which landlords now have a buyer for the property. Buyer intends to move into the property. They're given the 90 day notice because that 90 day notice for a buyer moving in has nothing to do with COVID evictions. That buyer is still obligated to, to leave. And yet they're saying, you can't evict me for COVID eviction. And in one case we had then run the tenant run to an attorney and the attorney then was using the COVID eviction thing to basically go up and say, no, you can't evict them. And you know, it ended up being such a mess. Our seller had to spend over ten thousand dollars to finally get that tenant who had who who hadn't made a payment, uh, was in, in in a terrible had done a terrible the dam the damage to the property was extensive uh, to finally get them out of the property so that the buyer could finally close. In representing a buyer in a situation like this, obviously you know you do not want to close if you have a situation like this going on because then that problem becomes yours because now you're the owner, you're the de facto uh, landlord. So representation of a buyer in these situations is pretty serious. So what happens to the sales contract mm -hmm. if the seller can't close on the uh, scheduled closing date yeah, because, because of an eviction issue? Right. What happens? To, does the contract sunset? Well, here, basically, because you have a contract in which the seller is to perform by getting the tenant out. Yeah, the, sell, the seller cannot perform. The seller is not. They're basically in breach of contract. So, so the earnest money. Yeah. Well, what? Well, well, what can we do? Because the seller is the one not performing. So can this buyer start the process for a suit for specific performance? Yeah, they can. Well, you know, here, here's a given situation. We have a, a buyer who has performed fully throughout the course of a transaction. We had a set date after the 90 days. So it was, you know, 90 day plus after the notice was given, we were we were informed that the notice had been given, the tenant won't leave. They said they're not ready to leave, they can't leave. Um, they say they need more time. So our buyer agrees to an extension on the close date, but on the new day for closing, the tenant is still there. In the meantime, no eviction has been started because really the seller after that 90 days should have started the process for a sheriff's eviction, but they didn't, they didn't perform that way. So the tenant now says, we get word that the seller is working very hard, has offered cash for keys, has offered to assist the tenant with moving, has done all kinds of stuff. The tenant says, if you push me any harder, I'm not gonna leave at all. So what the seller should have done was to start the eviction process on day 91 when the tenant wasn't out, but didn't. So what is- but He was probably acting on good faith. He probably seller. was, he probably was. So how, how do we handle something like that? Because now the timeline for closing 
is very challenging like for four, four months. Yeah, for the buyer. The buyer who had, you know, say you have a buyer who has scheduled everything, had sold their home, now potentially could be homeless. Or say you have a buyer who who has set up moving trucks and has set up all kinds of things with this anticipation of moving into the new property. Yeah, yeah, Jane. Keep, you keep your fingers crossed. You know, it, it is it is a challenging time. So, and then say your say that your hat's on the side of the seller. What are you doing as a real estate professional to counsel your seller throughout the course of this? You're you're letting your seller know. <clears throat> This is what the law is, and your tenant hasn't moved. Now, you're, you're in breach of contract, seller. You, you, you haven't done, you haven't performed. And I know you're relying upon a third party perform. Well, have you done everything that the law allows you to do in concerning this third party, <coughs> this tenant who is basically manipulating and using this, the eviction moratorium to take advantage of you and to take advantage of the situation. Or they can't find a place to live. Or they can't find a place to live. Or they can't find a place to live. Place to live. That's true. Maybe, you know, maybe the tenant is acting in good faith. Because the thing is, this is a tenant also who has not been paying their rent. That's what I say, nobody taking on. Yeah, but the landlord can't report that to anybody and that can't be used according to the law as any reason to deny someone a place to live. So, I mean, how do you handle it? I mean, it's it's really, really challenging. This is when you actually usually get involved with attorneys. And you, yeah. Is it possible to, you know, just in the air, be transparent with the renter mm -hmm. or the tenant? If you, you know, want to give them the 90 day notice, just say, we're giving you this, and in good faith, we trust that you're going to take all the steps necessary to be out of there. Mm -hmm. If you fail to do so, um, there's going to be a sheriff's eviction, which is a whole other process. Right, right. I mean, just just to kind of let them know and say, like, hey, can I help you find a place for well, where I have these property management places? Yep. Yeah. Just so they have some places to go and, yeah. and reach out to me if you're having trouble. Obviously, I think being as cooperative as possible in a situation like this is really good. I think it's very, very helpful. You have to also think from a seller's perspective, this tenant hasn't they owe you a ton of money they haven't been paying and, and you're likely probably not going to collect that somehow oh, that's what i was going to yeah. ask if the landlord has any rights to, to go back that the funds rent. i don't know if the laws are going to change to that point because now the the adjustment now is that with what's happened because you think about the state has gotten an awful lot of covid relief <laughs> The, the state has gotten a lot of COVID relief, and now the laws are, are such setting up that now the landlord's entitled to 100%. But what do you do if the tenant never provides you back with that documentation? How do you prove that to anybody? I don't know. I don't know what kind of protections are out there. I don't know if you guys have heard of anything along those lines. I mean, I'm going to see when the session is over if I can get Jack to come in because uh, if you, you saw that committee documentation, mm -hmm. Jack was one of the people at the committee. He knows what's going on totally about all this. And so I would hope Jack can give us a kind of a good update about what's going on. What you were saying is correct. Yeah. We're on a, a website that's called Neighborhood and it uh, includes Northwest Crossings and all those areas. And every every few days they see somebody say, help my, uh, my landlord is selling the house. I've got to find another place to mm -hmm. stay. Mm -hmm. These are not like you're paying four and a half thousand bucks for it. Right. Northwest Crossing. And it's, it's suddenly they get banged like that. So help, we need another place to stay. Right, right. And they can't find anything. Yeah, it's it's a very challenging time because there's a lack of inventory, and we know that very much. And there's a lack of rentals because, you know, people are selling their property and people who are purchasing are not using it as investment, they're moving in. So here's some other questions. And again, I use the OregonRealtors.org as a great source. It, does a tenant have to let us show the home? What happens if they don't? Yes, the tenant is, unless the rental agreement provides otherwise, tenant must allow landlord and landlord's agents reasonable access to the home with at least 24 hours notice. But we've had times in which ten tenants have been so stubborn and it's like no you can't show my property period i'm scared because of COVID, 
or things like that. And so working with a tenant, trying to maintain as good a relationship as possible is really important, but it's really up to the seller or if they've hired a property management company to enforce the terms of their rental agreement so that the tenant will open the home up. You know, and, and that's challenging. It's very challenging. Um, also, you, you got to be careful about doing an unlawful entry, you know, because, you know, the tenant has the right to quiet enjoyment of their property. They give 24 hour notice to have lunch in. They do. And that's how most rental agreements are. So you give them 24 hour notice, they have to open the house up to let them. But we've had situations, Bill, uh, even prior to COVID, but after, after mostly after a statewide rent control hit in which the tenant said, no, you can't show my home. I think there's a difference between um, somebody who's renting a home or one or two homes and a property management company, because mm -hmm. the property management companies I work with, they got stone cold hearts. Yeah. They, they will come and they will knock on the door and right. they'll open it with their key and they will go in because they're allowed to under the conditions of the contract. Right. Whereas the average Joe Blow is renting his house to another person, they don't have any of that. Uh, hardness or meanness, mm -hmm. I would call it. Well, yeah, if you have a property management company who's definitely enforcing uh, oh, yeah. their contracts. I was so surprised. Yeah. I was kind of taken aback yeah. by just how abrupt they would be, they're willing to be. We've had situations in which we've had sellers uh, say to their tenants, you know, I need to have flexibility on showing this home because I need to sell it. So I'm going to give you a discounted rent this month. So you will be available on short notice to open your house up. And tenants have been receptive to this in the past. I haven't heard any stories like that during COVID. So it, it's COVID has, has hit a whole different level. In one case, this was terrible. We had a, uh, a tenant who was just being so challenging and had not, and was using the COVID excuse not to pay rent, was still working throughout the course of it. And just to get rid of him, because he just refused to, to do anything. We got the home into contract, but he just was not gonna leave, was not gonna leave. Our tenant, our landlord finally just paid him money. Here's $5,000, get out. And this is a guy who owed him so much money. And that was the easiest way to get rid of him. Yeah, yeah. and in and, and long-term thought process, the seller had to come to some realization, you know, I'm making so much money on this sale it is more than covering, but it's a, it's like the sense of injustice. But if you can put on your hat of what, what's the long-term benefit, I'm selling this house, I'm making a lot of money, and it's worth paying someone who owes me money to make I this happen. People misunderstand. Uh -huh. I think that you you as a landlord can report to the credit bureaus after the tenant's gone. But can you? Because I the, think you still can be, because the tenant's no longer your tenant. Uh, but that's that's the COVID eviction. They're keeping you from doing it. That's in the law. So before anyone does anything like that, I would really advise them to consult with a good real estate attorney who's really up on this sort of stuff. For instance, here's some other things. Who's responsible for del uh, delivering the notice? Seller, uh, the notice. And again, agents, real estate agents, we do not deliver termination notices. That's not our job to do. It's not our place. It's... Uh, unless you're the property manager and we don't deal with property management. And if a tenant doesn't move out, how can we protect buyers? Again, make sure your buyer doesn't close on property with that tenant unless they want to potentially inherit all the headaches connected with that tenant. They need to be fully informed about what's going on with this. Um, so I have a question. If you're representing the buyer, mm -hmm. um, so on the seller side, you said if they do the 90 days and then maybe have something in place like at 93 days you start a share if it start the eviction could you write that an addendum to the real estate agreement like as a buyer's agent asking them to you know initiate a share's eviction at 94 right. days yes you could okay. you could yeah. that's a very good idea that's a smart idea if they if the tenant doesn't leave if the tenant doesn't leave yeah after yeah 90 days. you also so. have to allow for some flexibility on closing yeah. you know you have to think about that too and if you have a loan lock, it's really challenging within 90, that's one, that's part of the issue we, we right when statewide rent control started is to get a loan lock. They you, you, yeah, they expire. And, you know, you, even with 90 days, they're expired. And so how, how can you make sure you get that really awesome 
rate, that mortgage rate. Yeah, but maybe yes. This, maybe this is why people are selling their rentals. A lot of people are selling their rentals. Now, Colorado doesn't have statewide rent control. So I don't know what's going on with that poor lady, you know, that, that yeah, the, the tenant who, or that woman who, I mean, the hell, that whole that tenant that from hell. It sounds like an simple insurance claim. It, it could be. And then the insurance paid for that. It wasn't because it wasn't the tenant. It was. It was. Well, it really wouldn't matter. The house was damaged. The house was damaged. The damage to the point had to be forever be done. Again, the damage they said was between two hundred fifty, two hundred fifty and three hundred thousand. I, they sold the house with that situation in place. Maybe the maybe the owner of the property did get insurance claim. I, I don't know. It's I'll, I'll try giving her a call. Find out what happened. It would be an interesting. I'm curious about that. So, the forms as again designated for landlords and property managers to terminate vacancies. Multifamily Northwest is a great website. This is a, a really great reference tool for, for people who are looking for tenant landlord loss and the Oregon Rental Housing Association. But I think Multifamily Northwest is, is a place that a lot of people refer to. So keeping up on what's going on here is things, the laws keep changing. Um, how do we keep protecting our clients and you know, I, I reference this all the time. They try to keep things up to date as much as possible on Oregon Realtors because this is our, our resource on, they're up on what's going on with the laws, they're up on what's going on with our representation. It's something to recognize, unless we are a property manager, which we are not, you know, we, we follow the rules here and we don't take on more than we are obligated to as someone who's just representing a buyer or a seller in a real estate transaction. We don't develop notes. We don't. I, I always talk to people who take on things that I, I'm always a little bit more concerned about because people, agents who, I mean, we all will go out there and vacuum the house before a showing. We'll all go on there and, and, and put things away. But when we take on obligations such as packing things for people or painting walls, you know, I'm, I'm that's outside of our scope of expertise. That's outside of what our E&O would cover because we're not painters. If you do paint walls, I hope you have a, a licensed contractor's license and you're operating from that perspective as someone who is, I'm here as a contractor, I'm not here as a realtor. Or if you go out there and do some minor repairs yourself, I'm always really frightened when people, I hear people do things like that. Uh, you're changing doorknobs out and your, your screwdriver slips and gouges the door. Who's responsible for that? You cause damage to a property. You were doing a, a helpful thing, but is that was not something you're obligated to do, and not something you should do because it's not under our license. Questions about this? Yeah, Jane. Well, in my situation, the mom is paying the rent, mm -hmm. um, so she and the tenant are both being paid bonuses. Um, what would you suggest when you're coming up to the last month in the 90 days? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I'm going to have the, the owner keep checking, mm -hmm. which she has been, you know, to make sure that she's got plans to move. Ha have they made? Have they started making any plans towards moving? Mm -hmm. Have they? Have they started packing boxes? Is there any indication whatsoever? I mean, it, you're. And so we're talking about a listing here. Under a normal, under a normal situation, <laughs> yes, but this is a single mom with six kids. Single mom with six kids. And I don't know what she can pack right. that the kids might need. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Christmas it's stuff. Is there a place to go? We're hoping. Her mom, her mom lives in Redmond. Uh -huh. Her mom's paying rent. So who's on the lease? Uh, she is. The daughter. The daughters. Yeah. yeah. Mom, has, mom has been paying the rent for the daughter, and we're talking about a listing we have coming on board in which our seller is trying to, uh, or no, what is the? It's under contract. It's under contract. Thank you. So it's under contract, and so the 90 days notice has been given. Yes. And so now we're waiting just to get through it so that then the we can close and the buyers can then move in. Right. So... Would it be advantageous for you to have your seller 
indicate with the tenants if you are not out by the 93rd day, we are going to start a sheriff's eviction. Mm -hmm. I think so. I think it would be very helpful. I, I think it would be the seller might have with that. Yes. Yeah. Have the seller be informed about what the next step would be if they're not out by that point in time, because technically the seller then is in breach of contract because the purchase agreement required that the seller remove the tenants, correct? Yeah. And so getting involved in enforcement of a suit for specific performance for the seller who hasn't performed because the tenant is still in place, you don't want to go that direction. Your seller doesn't want to go that direction. And I think most buyers are usually a little flexible on time frame on that. But if your seller is showing good faith in doing everything they legally can do yeah. to perform, I think that's a much better situation than just, oh, the, 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 the tenant's not out. So sorry, you know. No, following up with that, um, going back to the, like the 2009 days, it wasn't a tenant situation, but a homeowner that was losing their home. Mm -hmm. And I remember going in afterwards and they had taken everything. Yeah. Cabinets, bathtubs, toilets, yeah. sink, yeah. everything. This house was paint gutted. It was stripped, yes. But you should think they gave back units. That was yeah, yeah, yeah. Was we, we, I remember reading about someone who actually took the whole house. They ended up, <laughs> seriously, they ended up taking, this obviously took time, but they took apart the house. They took even the wood from the house. I mean, it, they tore the house entirely apart. So by the bank, when the bank finally foreclosed, there was nothing there but a foundation. You know, and, and that was insane. And that was someone... I mean, what were they going to do with all that stuff? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that was a crazy time. Uh, any comments or questions about any of this stuff? I know it's it's a little complicated. I think the comment I've run into this with the multiplexes I've sold. Mm -hmm. Know where the hell your authority stops, mm -hmm. and know your scope. Mm -hmm. um, if you've got a property management company involved, allow them to be the the hard ass on right. the deal. Right. Because they know how to handle it. You're, yeah. just a, you're just a babe in the woods walking around. Right. So I know opinions, and you don't know what you're talking right. about. Right. If if the seller has a property management company, they have hired to yeah. you know represent them in in their rental. They're the ones responsible for all this. As a buyer's rep, I yeah. was communicating with the property management company. Correct. The sellers were yeah. over in Eugene. Right. But I I got their permission to talk directly to the property management company. And the property management company got their permission to share information with me. Very helpful. And then, but you need to make that step. Right, right. And then I just let them take the lead, and they they managed it. They even got the uh, marijuana growing operation sold too. <laughs> and this was before we legal. Yeah. But they managed it yeah. because they named it, that's their business. Yeah, property managers they are the ones who have the contract in place with the tenant. You know, the seller has their contract with the property manager. Right. And, that's the and thing so, you watch, you yeah, into the, yeah, into the gap. Right. Do we, I'm just making an assumption that in town we have mostly, if not all, reputable property management companies? We, that would be, that'd be a, I think you're assuming you're correct. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we have property management companies that. Uh, what specific ones we recommend? We have some who we think are better than others, uh, a little more proactive, better, you know, and, and it varies over time. It depends on who's running them. You know, sometimes property management companies will sell out to some new owner who in turn has maybe a different business model than uh, the ones they had before. It, it's it's hard to know. You know, you, you we, want to lessen the property management company name assessment? Yeah. David, right? David. He okay, used a silent time for cold beer. He'll tell you why you should never get property management. Dave had a property management company. Yeah. Okay. And and then he ended up uh, selling out. His and, stories are beautiful. His stories are like this. Yeah. The, he the, said, really? He says, no, you've got no idea. The horror story of a oh, woman who just trashed said, the house. You do with your tenant. Yeah. You choose your tenants. Yeah. And he says, every now and then we, we don't choose well. Mm -hmm. But so I'm just like, if you're representing a buyer mm -hmm. or me or a seller, like, how to avoid property management companies that clearly don't check in for check your I, I would always check for reviews. Okay. 
and, and if you're interviewing property management companies, ask for a list of people, clients that you can call for, for testimonials. And, and do you have some examples of people that, you know, give me some examples of people. And I would also check their own reviews online too. And it's fine from Yelp. If, if, if there's people there that said they did a terrible job and they're recent, then maybe question that. Um, I always, we're, I, I don't personally put out negative Yelp reviews. Mm -hmm. But there are people out there who do. Sometimes they're just disgruntled people, and you can sometimes take those with a grain of salt. But if you have like a lot, then maybe there is some issue with those people. I know realtors. Um, you know, our testimonials are read, and millennials do definitely like to provide reviews. They also research people before they start working with them. So as far as a property management company, you'll see. You know, we have a book of you know, you, you manage the vendor book. And so what about, are these people still good property management companies? And really the best property management companies kind of limit how many, how many right, keys yeah. they take on. They take because to do a good job by them, you can't have, you know, an unlimited number of clients. And so I find some of the best ones are those say, I have, I don't have any openings right now, call back in, in six months. Uh, so, so that's, that's one who's, probably doing a really good job taking their business seriously and not taking on more than they can handle. Yeah. Well, and wasn't there one that also was referring people to their own brokerage? Like they, wasn't there one staff meeting that- Yeah, there, there are, that yeah, there are property managers out there who are also brokers. And I would hesitate to refer someone to a, who, a company who's also a brokerage. Yeah, because they would probably say, well, you're ready to sell your house. Yeah, uh, I talked with, um, you know, someone who had a really good attitude about that all was Michael Kozak. Michael Kozak, who has, he's he's been an agent here forever. He was an, he was the OER president at one time. He, he was, a I think he was a mayor of Bend at one he point. Was. Yeah, he, so he's been around forever. He's also a guy who used to always teach the orientation class for new agents at core so he's been involved in in government um, for quite some time he had a major property management company he's also a realtor and he would always say when people would refer clients to him say i will never take your client at the point of time when they're ready to sell because i recognize my business comes from property management that's a major source of income for me and if even if that person comes to me and says I'm ready to list, I wanna work with you. He'll say, no, I don't, I will not list your home. You should go back to the agent who referred me to you. So you already have an agent. So that, so, but how many of, of those brokerages are like that? Or how many of the property management companies are like that? I think it's better off as an agent just to utilize people who are strictly property management. That's all they do. Yeah. Cause there's a lot of hungry agents out there who are looking for a listing. <laughs> Anything else, guys? I just have some updates. Yeah, thank you. Can people hear me on that? Uh, probably not. I'll try to repeat what you're saying. Perfect. So next month we are planning a wine event with snacks as well um, on the 23rd of July. Yeah. It will be a happy hour style for information to come. Mm -hmm. um, and Julie has a new listing that she wants everyone to know is going live soon on Butte Branch Road. Um, four bed, five full bath on just under, or just over 19 and a half acres. It's going to be listed at 1.85. I know we're doing the Matterport today on that one. Yeah, she just emailed us to yeah. say that. Awesome. I think that's all. We've got a lot of high-end listings coming on board, which is really exciting and great. Uh, it's even better when they sell, you know, and close. So it's the nature. I'm amazed how many million dollar plus buyers there are out there. Yeah, yeah. And I, if anybody's got anything Riverfront coming up. Riverfront. Mm -hmm. Angeles is not Riverfront. Uh, I do know something that's coming up Riverfront, Jane. I do. Not yet. Uh, we don't have a signed contract yet. So um, once once I have once we have a signed contract on it. It's 
I don't think you know about this one. Okay. Yeah, I this don't. This one was out near. Joe, Joe, Joe's going to be selling his house in the fall. Yeah. Oh, that one. Yeah. Yeah. I've got the information. On yeah, on Joe, on Cheney Road. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. But that didn't with the listing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's not right on the river. It has river, deeded river, river access. He's across the street and there's a house there. But he has deeded river access, so people have the right to go to that river. A very quiet, wild location there. Pardon? Uh, no. And then I, I had um, one buyer need one to two million. They want something in an Aubrey Butte area with the primary suite on the main floor. That's an absolute must for them. Okay. Um, they don't have one. <laughs> they they are fine being patient. They have other properties um, in Oregon that they can help you just really for the perfect thing. You can put that in a suit remarks. In what? Under public remarks, if you Google, if you go quick search, uh -huh. you can put in there a uh, master on me. Oh, okay. Or some, you know, just other words similar to that. Okay. Uh, because agents will put that because it is something that older people. Yeah. It is it's one of the search criteria that you have on advanced searches. You yeah. can put that down in an advanced search, right? Yeah. It's no longer called master. It, it's one of those things that, yeah, yeah it's now primary. I know, primary. I got corrected. Yeah, it's, it's, like, I need a master on the main, like, primary. Yeah, our, our, MLS, <laughs> our MLS input sheets still say master. They're being converted over to primary. Uh, it's just, I, I guess, for some reason, master sounds, it's become. Um, We're losing our influence, what can I say? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Okay, any other haves or wants, guys, before we break? Okay, well, thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks for the update.